All right, everyone is uh, silent, so uh, we can start. Thank you so much for being here, all of you. I'm really happy to see so many faces. There are also more than 100 people online registered, so that's also really nice. People online, welcome as well. You can put your, uh, uh, your questions on the mail address. I'll, I'll send you, and we certainly will address also your questions after the talk. But first, let me introduce Martin Storms to you. Welcome. You are uh, the curator of maps and atlases at our own library, university library, with a wonderful collection of maps and atlases. He's not only curator, he's really bringing the wonderful collection to the audience, to everyone. He, had, he made a wonderful book published by Lano only a year ago, I think, but he will uh, talk more about that himself later. And I also uh, want to especially mention a wonderful exhibition that's still running and that will be also central to Martin's uh, talk today, Maps Navigating and Manipulating. It's still running till uh, 29th of October at the National Museum of World Cultures, more or less around the corner here uh, in Leiden, close to the railway station for the people online, so do go and, and visit. Martin, thank you so much for being here. For yours. So, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to say something about this exhibition in Museum Volkenkunde, as we say in Dutch, or the National Museum of Ethnology, a museum actually with uh, a lot of different names. Yes. I will. <laughs> I change every time, and uh, well, I come back to that a bit uh, uh, later. Um, why uh, this exhibition? Well, um, the first uh, idea to make an exhibition was because last year, in 2022, it was exactly 150 years ago that Johannes Tiberius Bodel Nijenhuis died. Now, who was this Bodel Nijenhuis guy? He was probably the uh, greatest private map collector that have, has ever lived worldwide. Uh, here in Leiden, he lived at Rapenburg, actually uh, uh, the neighbor of this building, uh, just uh, two houses away at number 69. And um, he was the last generation of Luchtmans publishing house, but it was not a real businessman, so when he... Uh, got the chance, he sold the publishing house to Brill. So that is uh, the publishing house Brill that is still uh, exists today. And from that time, he devoted his life basically uh, full time on his private collect uh, collecting of maps and atlases, and also topographical prints and drawings, and he had a huge library and so on. Uh, he died in 1872. And uh, by in his will, he had um, made sure that his collection was kept together uh, after he died and was brought over to the university library. So basically, from 1872 onwards, Leiden University Libraries has an uh, important map collection. That's basically the start and the core of this collection. Um, now, to commemorate that 150 years of map collection in the library, uh, we wanted to make a book. So, uh, last year, um, Stein already told that uh, a book was published at Lano Publishers, titled uh, Maps That Made History, uh, 1000 Years of World History in 100 Old Maps. And basically, it's an overview of uh, the variety of the map collections in our library. Uh, with that book, which is published in Dutch and in English, we also wanted to make an exhibition. Um, well, a little bit more about the book. My name is on the cover, but uh, we were in an editing team with six people, three historians here of the Faculty of Humanities, uh, two colleagues of the library and myself, and uh, 50 historians and scholars contributed with um, entries on specific uh, maps. So, um, well, I was kind of a main author and um, a project leader of this book process, but I didn't make it completely on my own. Um, and last year also was Leiden uh, 20, 
2022 European City of Science. So the book and especially the exhibition was made part of that uh, celebrating program. Uh, well, I already uh, said I would say something about uh, the name of the museum. So there are four um, uh, world culture museums in the Netherlands that since some years form one organization. It's the Museum of the Tropics in Amsterdam, Tropenmuseum, uh, the National Museum of Ethnology, Volkenkunde, here in Leiden, uh, Africa Museum in Bergendal, near Nijmegen, and the World Museum in Rotterdam. And uh, I saw just yesterday that uh, all these institutions changed their uh, social media profile names to World Museum Amsterdam, World Museum Leiden, World Museum Bergendal, and World Museum Rotterdam. So the new name of this, uh, um, well, combination of four museums will be World Museum. So from next year onwards, we only say World Museum Leiden and not Museum for Ethnology anymore. Well, um, we wanted to make an exhibition with the, with the book, but of course uh, the museum has its own agenda and their exhibitions have to fit in their own profile and in their mission. And uh, the mission of the museum is uh, to contribute to better world citizenship by teaching people to think critically and ask questions. And, um, well, more practical, practically that meant that uh, the exhibition had to fit into that team. So basically more emphasis was laid on non-Western uh, perspectives and also regions outside Europe. So the maps we selected were more or less uh, uh, the regions that are also present in the museum. Um, the exhibition was compiled by uh, some people of the museum, uh, curator Erna Lilje, Lisbeth Auerhand, who was the curator for photography there, but doesn't work there anymore, and Anne-Marie Wollet, together with uh, myself. Uh, and uh, it had its limitations, also because of the length of the exhibition. It ran, runs for a year. So that means that uh, no very vulnerable uh, maps could be uh, displayed. So no manuscript maps were selected, no maps on vellum. And for some maps, because of delicate uh, colors, uh, we have to uh, switch the maps or swap the maps after six months uh, for another copy. Um, and here the uh, photo on the right is the beginning of the exhibition. So it starts with a wall with uh, some globes and the explanation of what the exhibition is about. Um, how is the exhibition uh, set up? Uh, we have three main themes, forms of maps, what can be mapped and the effects of maps. And uh, the first theme, forms of maps, is more about uh, um, how you say that. The um, sorry, <laughs> I forgot what the how the maps look like. And uh, the second theme, what can be maps, is uh, mapped is more about the um, content of the, the maps. And the third theme is more, yeah, it says the effects of maps. And these three main themes are subdivided in some uh, um, sub-themes. And, well, in the next slide you will see what uh, we selected for these themes. Uh, but before I go into that, I, I will say something more about the design. Uh, the exhibition was designed by Wendy Rommers, who has her own uh, design bureau. So here we see some uh, plans of the corridors in the museum. Uh, I don't know if you know the Museum Volkenkunde, but there are some large uh, rooms um, which are devoted to specific countries or regions or uh, continents. And on the side of these rooms are small corridors or galleries as they call it. And uh, these are most of the time empty or um, available for temporary uh, exhibitions. So we um, could use two of these corridors for this exhibition. 
And a nice uh, thing about uh, the design, which had its limitations because uh, of money, for instance, um, but uh, still, um, I think uh, Wendy uh, did a great job. And a nice thing, I don't know if you see the cursor, maybe not, but there is a dotted line that goes through the whole uh, exhibition over the floors, but also over the walls, like a kind of bended route, and also connects the two corridors uh, together because they're not exactly next to each other, but following that dotted line through the museum, uh, you come to the second uh, part of the exhibition. So that is a nice thing about the design. Um, let me see. So this is uh, some impressions of the design of the first uh, gallery. Uh, and then the first gallery, which is a longer gallery, uh, the first two main themes of the exhibitions are, uh, um, are there. So that is um, the forms of maps and what can be mapped. And uh, some transparent curtains were also uh, used to make some spaces for specific uh, video animations that were uh, included in the exhibition. This is the second corridor, so that's the third team. So this uh, uh, part of the exhibition was specifically um, uh, devoted to the effects of map. And this one is smaller than the, than the first um, gallery. And here are some more impressions of that uh, room from above and from uh, the sides. So then we come to uh, the first uh, main theme of the exhibition, Forms of Maps. So the first uh, sub-theme uh, is a simplification. You could also say um, generalization or uh, projection. So the main problem uh, that um, map makers, cartographers have is to transform the spherical uh, surface of the Earth to the flat surface of a map. So that always leads to distortion. So you can choose for equal area projections that the uh, sizes of the different countries uh, are still comparable. But you can also choose for other uh, uh, things that the, that the forms are more or less the same, but then uh, yeah, other ways of distortions will take place. And actually the only projection, or only world map which is accurate is a globe. And one of the items in the exhibition is this uh, uh, piece of paper with uh, gorge or uh, globe segments from 1621, a Jansonius globe, a small globe, um, which still had to be cut out and pasted on, on, a, on a spherical, uh, yeah, on a sphere. Um, but this is the only thing uh, what has survived of this globe, so no complete um, fabricated globe uh, is there, only this piece of paper. So in a movie which we made, I created uh, that globe by cutting out uh, a copy of the, this <laughs> one, not the original of course, and uh, paste it on a, a piece of, uh, on, a, on a spherical uh, form uh, and someone else made an, a digital animation and I think I can uh, play this. Yeah, now it's uh, going around so you get an impression how this globe uh, should look like when it's uh, completed. So I wait uh, before it's <laughs> around. It will stop at some point, but uh, let's go on. Uh, here another impression of uh, this first part of the exhibition, so uh, simplification. And we selected some uh, world maps in different projections. So I showed you uh, the globe segments. There is uh, a, a Japanese world map in two hemispheres, the two circles you see here, and uh, some others. And also this application, which you see on the left, which is the Mercator projection, which is absolutely not equal area, but um, 
uh, Gerard Mercator, Mercator uh, Flemish cartographer in the 16th century, created this projection for navigation. So what he did was to make a projection where every compass direction is a straight line. So that's very uh, useful for uh, navigation, for shipping. Um, but, um, well, it, uh, the effect is that it got distorted uh, towards the poles. So the, um, the further north and the further south you come, uh, the, the larger the, the regions are uh, depicted. Um, so it inflates the size of objects away from the equator. And a good example is uh, Greenland, which is on this map. It's the big white uh, spot uh, in the north, uh, which looks like it's almost as big as Africa. But in this application, you can select Greenland and drag it towards Africa. And you see this blue uh, part, which is the actual size of Greenland. So you can compare in this projection the real size of, of uh, different uh, Region. So you see how large these distortion uh, towards the pole, uh, poles are. On the right, a uh, very modern um, world map, Chinese world map from 2013. It's actually the last map in the book, which has 100 maps in chronological order. And uh, you cannot really say what is north here because uh, the two poles are both on this world map, so the North Pole and the South Pole. And uh, above the North Pole, you can see North America upside down. And uh, China and Asia more or less in the center of this map, which is also a thing that every country tends to uh, place the, its own uh, country in the center of, of a world map. There's also some political ideas behind this uh, map. Um, so China claims because it uh, represents one-fifth of the world population, that it also uh, should uh, have access to the uh, sources of the North and the South Pole for uh, a fifth part. And also for navigation and because of climate change, especially the North Pole area will become more important for uh, sea trade and sea routes. And this map shows that sea routes from China to Europe and North America are much shorter over uh, the North Pole, then uh, via the uh, Indian Ocean and the Suez Channel. This is another Chinese uh, world map, or actually a Japanese copy of a Chinese world map um, from 1663. And um, it's both a map of China and the world map. So in the center, very large. China is depicted with all its provinces, and uh, I think it's visible. Uh, you see the, 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 the Great Wall in the north. But around China, uh, the rest of the world is depicted too, but relatively much smaller than China itself. So it basically uh, tells the story of China within uh, the world, or uh, yeah with the countries that uh, surround China. It's not all very clear, but you can see a kind of greenish island uh, in the northeast that should be Cuba. I cannot read Chinese myself, but uh, people who can told me this. And in the uh, upper left corner, you can uh, see Europe, and I um, enlarged that part of the map. And I think you can recognize uh, the British Isles, Scandinavia, and the Mediterranean. So it's uh, quite distorted, but uh, it's, so it is a world map because the, all the countries that surround China are on this map as well. The second sub-theme of this first main theme is navigation. Um, wait. This is a very long, 12 meter long map of the Tokaido Road, which is the main uh, trading route between the imperial capital Kyoto and the shogunal capital Edo, present day Tokyo in uh, Japan. So it's a kind of Leporello or uh, uh, concertina map, so you can fold it uh, and then it becomes a very small booklet. Uh, but when you unfold it, it's 12 meters uh, long. 
and it shows the whole uh, route uh, from Kyoto to uh, Tokyo. Uh, we don't have a, a showcase uh, that is 12 meter long, so what we did is every month show another part of this map, so the real uh, map fans can come back to the museum every month and then see uh, every time another part of this route map. Here's a detail of the eastern part with uh, Edo and the Shogunal Castle in the upper right corner. And what you also see is these red uh, um, squares, and these are compass roses. And that's because uh, the route is not in reality a straight line, but the map is more or less a straight line. So at every section, the direction of the map uh, changes. So the, the compass rose indicates where north is on that part of the map. So that's also a form of manipulation, what is the main theme of this exhibition. So here you see that this again on the left, uh, cut up in four pieces, uh, the, the complete uh, Tokaido road map, and on the right, uh, a modern map uh, with the real um, route of that Tokaido road, which has uh, 53 stations, so that were also resting points and where you can sleep and can eat. So the map also gives a lot of information for tourists and travelers uh, what to expect in certain places along the route. So, um, let me see. Um, next to the maps from the university library, there are also um, modern works of art in the exhibition and this kind of video animations. Uh, I didn't dare to include a real animation because uh, uh, it not always works uh, when you present live. So please uh, check that online. It's on the uh, National Museum of Australia. Uh, you can see the whole video of seven and a half minutes or go to the museum, of course, where it's visible as well. And this is um, the story uh, line or a song line uh, of the tracking of the seven sisters and that uh, showcases the five First Nations song lines from Australia's Western and Central Deserts. Um, so it's a kind of saga from uh, the Aboriginal people which has a link to uh, the specific locations in Australia and follows that route and ends in uh, the starry sky and the constellations. So, uh, that is really beautifully uh, visualized in this, visualized in this uh, animation. And on the left still, you can see the outline of Australia. Um, a second team, or a third team, I must say, is uh, aesthetic maps. So maps were not only made to be a functional tool for traveling or uh, whatever, but also uh, to be beautiful. Um, and so a small section of the exhibition uh, is more devoted to that, and we selected two wall maps. Um, so maps also have this, this representational or decorational uh, function, so maps to impress or uh, to be kind of status symbols. So here's an example of a map that was swept after six months. So the first six months we have this map of Africa, which you see on the left, and uh, now it's the map of Asia. Uh, but you can clearly see they belong uh, together. Um, and they are part of a set of five uh, wall maps, which is the world map and the four continents. We only have these two in our collections. Uh, published by a lesser known Amsterdam publisher, Joachim Boormeester, in two sheets and a separate seat, sheet for the, the title on the top. And what is a nice practical thing of this map is that uh, for this title stroke, uh, the publisher used the same copper plates, um, but then here for Asia, pasted a small separate strip with the name Asia on top of the original title, so that he doesn't have to make a complete new uh, title uh, copper plate. And the problem with Asia is that it's uh, 
a small word, so there is some space left. Uh, that's why it doesn't look uh, really uh, uh, great, that title. Um, okay. And the other, world, uh, other wall map is uh, this special map of the Philippines. And what is special on this map is that it is published in the Philippines itself. So it's a kind of co-production of the Spanish colonists and Jesuits who were there uh, together with local artists. Uh, it's basically the map of the Philippines, so uh, the most important map in the history of Philippine uh, cartography, you can say, and a map with an own Wikipedia page. Uh, and on that page it stated that about 20 copies worldwide of this map uh, still exist. Um, the images on the left and uh, right side of this map are drawn by local artists, so that is the, the local influence of this map. And that is also uh, an aspect we wanted to stress, that uh, maps are often made by Westerners, by colonizers from a Western uh, perspective, but uh, when you look closely you can see they um, uh, really needed uh, the local information to make these maps. And this is a clear example where the local people and the colonizers uh, work together to uh, produce this map. Published in Manila in 1734. The second theme, uh, what can be mapped? So that is about uh, all the topics that you can put in, in a map, which not only have to be geographical uh, uh, information, so basically, you can map everything. So a first sub-theme there is Worlds Imagined. Uh, so that is about uh, non-real places. This is a very rare map of uh, Atlantis, um, made by a French scholar who lived in Utrecht, or near Utrecht, Maximilien Henri de Saint-Simon. Uh, and he studied the work of Plato, who, uh, who wrote about Atlantis and where it was and how big it was. And um, Plato had the idea that Atlantis should be as big as Europe, Africa and Asia together. So that's the, the colored part of the map. So then the idea was when Atlantis should be that big, it's almost covering the complete at, uh, Atlantic Ocean. So it looks very, very strange, but uh, that's a very nice map, actually. Um, another sub-team, communicating knowledge. Yeah, that can be uh, anything. Um, this is about the interior of the Earth. Um, uh, the maps on the right are not in the exhibition, but are the sources uh, for the map. Uh, that you can see on the left. So the images on the right are from the book Mundus Subterraneus by Athanasius Kircher, a German uh, scholar who uh, went to uh, volcanoes and studied uh, lava and uh, created theories about uh, how uh, the interior, interior of the world uh, looked like. And the Dutch uh, natural historian Theodore Schoon actually made a combination of all these prints in the work of Kircher uh, to a kind of uh, overview map of uh, a cross-section of the world and how that interior uh, looked like. Um, not only volcanoes, but also mining, uh, you can see. And here are some details. So on the left, uh, the interior of the world with some um, uh, underground rivers and uh, seas of fire, that were the theories at the end of the 17th century. Uh, but also about the atmosphere um, and the weather phenomena here above the sea with uh, kind of uh, whirlpools and things like that. And uh, some images of mining activities with miners who uh, uh, do some mining work. And what is special about this map, another aspect, is that it was published by a woman. And that is quite rare in the 17th century. Uh, we know of many um, women in the history of cartography um, in the early modern period, but these were almost always uh, widows of male 
map makers or mail publishers who continued the company uh, when their men uh, uh, died. But in this case it's different because uh, the husband of Elisabeth van Lin or Elisabeth de Jong, which is her own name, uh, she only started a print business after her man died. So she thought, well, finally I can do what I really want. So it's, I think, a real uh, 17th century power woman. Um, a third sub-team here is mapping the body and brain. Um, this is a special uh, modern work of art, but also a map of the Chinese artist Chu ZG, I hope I pronounce it correctly. And um, it is a set of uh, utopian political ideas put together. You can see Marxism, but also uh, capitalism and also uh, things like that. Uh, concepts which also have a kind of utopian uh, idea behind it. It's also geofiction because it is a map of uh, a place with this, which is not can be found on Earth, uh, not related to the geographic reality. And when you look closely, it also looks like a kind of a human body. I don't know for sure if that was the idea of the artist, but on the right you see two legs and, and feet, I think. I don't think uh, the, the circular thing in the, uh, on the right, uh, upper right uh, corner is a football, but uh, who, who will know? And a kind of loose hat on the left, but well, maybe it's more coincidental, I don't know. Um, and in this same team, another modern uh, work of art is this by Zipporah Johnston, the map of the autistic brain. So basically a map of uh, the artist uh, herself. It's also called the Zipporah Campus. And this is really funny. You should uh, read the uh, legend, the key uh, of this map, which has very uh, funny uh, things. I can read it on my screen, so I just look here. For instance, um, uh, let me see, number three in the center, the fountain of useless trivia. Or number 16 uh, in the, uh, in the uh, right, uh, lower right corner, the oubliette where pins, names and important tasks go to die. Now, and more things like that. Also a cat radar. So uh, really funny to, uh, to watch closely. It looks actually in the museum, it's uh, printed on the wall like uh, uh, a plan of the museum itself, but it's not. <laughs> uh, infographics is another theme. Um, and actually this map can be seen as a vertical timeline uh, from Noah, the biblical uh, story of Noah and his sons, uh, who were the basis of the people of the world, uh, up to the uh, nations in the early 18th century um, below. It's depicted as a river delta, and uh, it's the oldest uh, so-called uh, stream of times map. In the literature, it's always said that the one by Friedrich Strass, German, who made a similar map uh, 100 years later, was the oldest, and this map uh, looks like it's forgotten, so it was kind of a find uh, for myself uh, when I realized this and uh, really wanted to put this map in the book as well as in the exhibition. Um, and when you look closely, all these river streams uh, come together in the top uh, at Noah, or start there, and then uh, they divide. But uh, on the right side, there is one separate stream that doesn't come from Noah, and that when you follow it downwards, you see it's Ch the Chinese people. So they probably have no biblical uh, origin. And uh, on the right, a detail, on the most right, you see a small stream, and that is uh, America, where uh, uh, an Inca and uh, Aztec uh, leader are named, and uh, a small lake which says 1492 America Detecta. Then we come to the third uh, theme. I have no idea how, how long I have uh, <laughs> spoken, <laughs> uh, so I just go on. Um, the effects of map. Um, so 
let's say, um, I love maps from a very young age because I think they are beautiful. I can look hours to it. But the more I study it, um, I realize that uh, the stories behind these maps are not that beautiful as the maps uh, themselves. So this theme is about these uh, sometimes negative effects of the maps. So a lot of maps has to do with territorial claims. Here's another impression of this second uh, gallery in the museum. And uh, we selected some maps with, uh, on this theme of territorial claims. This comes from the Africa Museum. Uh, it's a kind of uh, slide map with on the left uh, in colors the colonial borders of 1914 and on the right uh, the different population groups or tribes in Africa. And uh, on top of it you can uh, put a transparent layer with the colonial borders and the present day borders and uh, switch that to compare. And you can see that there is actually no relation uh, uh, be, uh, between these borders and the, the, the population groups. So that explains a lot of the problems that uh, still occur today in Africa. And uh, the basis for this problem, of course, is the 1884-1885 the, uh, Berlin Conference where the European powers uh, divided Africa amongst uh, each other. And next to it we have uh, Bos Atlas, the famous Dutch school atlas of just a few years later. And then you see that the colonial borders start to emerge on the map. So it's still not completed. Uh, so it took to the early 20th century when the whole continent was uh, subdivided. But here the first straight lines often, these, these, uh, these borders, uh, emerge on the map. And in the legend you see uh, uh, indicated in colors what European country uh, was colonizing what part of Africa. A more modern example of territorial claims is the South China Sea. Um, that is um, the famous nine dash line, so it's called, so the, the dashed border uh, which is claimed by China and uh, we are not uh, promoting this Chinese ID in the exhibition but show actually uh, the craziness of, uh, of these claims because China claims the com complete South China Sea. So, oh, that's it, yes again. Um, so there's no part of the sea left for the other countries that surround the South Ch China Sea like Vietnam, uh, the Philippines and uh, Malaysia. And uh, next to this map, we have an animation of a series of satellites, images of a small island or more a rock in that South China Sea on which China built a naval base. So you see within 10 years that from an uh, empty island, a complete uh, naval base uh, was uh, um, uh, constructed uh, there. And the last example of territorial claims is this map of Argentina, so um, which is also a bit uh, strange because it's not only mainland Argentina, but also the claim of Argentina uh, of the section of the South Pole. And on uh, the right, um, you see a map of all the claims of, um, on the South Pole. And especially in that part uh, uh, where Argentina has its claims, uh, there are overlapping claims. Um, there is a Chilean claim and a British claim. So basically you need two Antarcticas to uh, um, satisfy all these uh, claiming countries. But it stays with claims because in the United Nations it is uh, still um, decided that uh, no country can claim the South Pole. Uh, one of my favorite themes are propaganda maps. So we have a section on that theme as well. So um, it's always important in general to understand that maps are not really neutral uh, images, but 
you always have to think uh, who made this map and uh, what is the story they want to tell with it, especially, of course, with propaganda maps. Uh, this is the oldest one, which is also served as the image for the cover of the book uh, from 1598. Uh, so that's when we're talking about the Dutch Revolt, an anti-Spanish propaganda map. Um, and there were earlier anthropomorphic maps of Europe, where Europe was um, uh, depicted as a queen or a virgin. And that these maps actually uh, were pro-Spanish or pro-Habsburg, uh, telling the story that uh, Europe, a united Europe under Habsburg rule can bring peace on the continent. But here it's turned around by the, the Dutch uh, um, protesters. And uh, here the Spanish queen is depicted as an aggressor with a raised uh, sword. So. Um, anti-Spanish propaganda. This is uh, actually the earliest uh, cartoon map, what we call cartoon maps of Europe, where individual countries are depicted as anthropomorphic or zoomorphic uh, images. Uh, it uh, dates from 1854, that's the time of the Crimean War. And that was actually the first war that was reported uh, on a daily basis in Western uh, newspapers because of telegraph lines, which were then for the first time available. The news uh, could be spread uh, uh, quickly uh, far away from the, from the front. And also photography uh, was there, so uh, photos were put in these newspapers so people could really see the... Uh, negative sides and the, the, the this, uh, destruction that a war uh, brings. And that le led to a commentary in the newspaper uh, in textual form, but also in this form of kind of uh, satirical uh, cartoon maps. Um, so the uh, countries are depicted as uh, animals, basically. We see uh, Britain as a lion, France as an eagle, Turkey as a turkey and uh, the Russian beer. Yeah, that's uh, kind of a joke in this map. Um, and when we zoom in on uh, the Black Sea and the Crimean uh, Peninsula, we see the French-British fleet uh, around uh, Crimea uh, clipping the nails of the paw of the Russian beer. And uh, soon after this map was published, this, the British and French uh, uh, go on land and, and took over uh, Crimea. And this genre of uh, cartoon maps became very popular uh, later on. Um, in the, for instance, the French-German War in 1870, also in the First World War. This is a map of 1900, 1900 on the left. And um, uh, here uh, Russia is depicted as an octopus, which is also an... Uh, kind of um, recurring the theme in these uh, cartoon maps. So an aggressor is uh, often depicted as an octopus with uh, tentacles. Uh, that is the same for the uh, map on the right, which is a German um, um, propaganda map from the First World War, which depicts uh, Britain as an octopus. And uh, the title, Freiheit der Meere, or Freedom of the Seas, refers to the speech by Woodrow Wilson, the American president, president we ca who came with a plan of 14 points for peace, or to end the First World War. And one of these points was freedom of the seas, but actually France and Britain were against that principle. So here the Germans tried to uh, drive a wedge to uh, drive the Allies apart. And a last example of propaganda is this missionary map, really meant to recruit uh, missionaries. So the map itself has uh, hierarchical uh, colors indicating the religions. So blue is Protest Protestant, red are Catholics, gray uh, ortho the, the Orthodox uh, Church, yellow is the Islam, and black are the heathens. So that's the, the regions where uh, work has to be done for the missionary. Um, and what's maybe more interesting are the images that surround uh, the map. 
So it's basically pairs of images uh, which show uh, the situation before Christianization and after. For instance, in the upper right corner, you can see uh, infant burying in China where uh, ch children uh, were um, buried alive. I don't know if that was uh, true. And then uh, below that, uh, someone preaching uh, to the Chinese and everything was uh, at peace. Uh, this was an other example of a map that was swept after six months because of the delicate colors. So we also have a Dutch uh, copy of the, this map that was published some years later, but also was adjusted to the Dutch audience. So the North American scenes of the uh, Inuit people were uh, changed for uh, some scenes in Indonesia, the Netherlands, East Indies. Oh, it was not the last example of propaganda, sorry. This is the most modern uh, propaganda map in the exhibition, and this is North Korean uh, propaganda, um, published in English, English so uh, really meant for the foreign uh, public, uh, also published by the Foreign Languages Publishing House in uh, Pyongyang. And um, what it does is that it emphasizes and basically exaggerates the role of Kim Il-sung, the later uh, party leader in North Korea, uh, in the struggle against the Japanese occupation. So uh, Korea was occupied by Japan uh, until the end of the Second World War. And this map claims that basically it was only thanks to Kim Il-sung that the Japanese were uh, um, uh, defeated. Um, another theme in this uh, effects of map is exploitation. So we have some plantation maps from Indonesia, so tobacco plantations on uh, Sumatra on the left and uh, a map of the Banda Islands uh, on the right where nutmeg was um, it was one of the few islands where nutmeg was produced. And when you look at uh, a cartouche in the upper corner, it's maybe not really visible here, but there are some putti which hold uh, uh, nutmeg uh, branches uh, in their hand. And of course, also in the Americas, uh, there uh, are the famous plantation maps here of uh, Suriname. Um, it's a map of 1758, um, and the coincidence was that uh, three main map collections in the Netherlands, that is the National Archives, Allard Pearson, what, which is the special collection of the University of Amsterdam and Leiden University, had a map exhibition at the same time. And this, was, uh, um, this map was in all three exhibitions, so uh, that was uh, kind of a coincidence, I think. Um, uh, where was I? Um, and on the right is uh, part of a map of West Africa where uh, the names of the countries are named after the products that uh, the colonizers got there. So we see from left to right, it's in Dutch. So Tandkust, Tooth Coast, Teeth Coast, uh, Gold Coast, and Slave Coast. And when we zoom in on the map of uh, Suriname, we see outside uh, the, the, the area where the plantations are, so in the forest, some uh, villages that are the maroon villages, so the runaway uh, slaves who uh, settled themselves in the forests. But here these villages are uh, burned down. So it's the message of the colonizers that they had these uh, oppression of the Maroons under control, which was not really the case in reality. And on the other side, you also see some villages of free Indians, so the uh, Native American uh, people. So then I'm uh, reaching the end of the exhibition. The last piece is this work of art by uh, Faisal Saro, an artist from Groningen, uh, someone from uh, Suriname uh, descent. And he made this uh, map of his own body. Um, it's called Yeye. 
and um, um, well, the artist has a chronic disease, so all his personal experiences and uh, experience with his body are um, visualized in this map. So some parts are left uh, vague because, yeah, that has to do with what he feels uh, with these parts. Um, there's also, it's a kind of an insulation, so you can see a kind of uh, body which is moving, which has to do with the windy um, um, uh, religion, which is, uh, which is, is related to. And uh, what he also did is put names of his ancestors in his map. So you can see kind of dotted line with the names of his uh, four fathers and four mothers um, based on what is known of gene genealogical research, what his family did. And um, that he uh, put on fragments of nautical charts of Suriname uh, of the places where he know his ancestors lived. So that's the cartographical connection with this, uh, this piece. Um, there's an explanatory video with this piece where he explains himself exactly what this uh, piece of art is about, which he can do much better than I. And also we made a series of uh, videos uh, for social media and it's, you can see it uh, on uh, YouTube. So every month we made a short video and sometimes a bit uh, longer video to uh, yeah, keep attention for uh, the exhibition throughout the year. Um, so there are still four weeks uh, to go. So if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, I would invite you uh, to go to the museum uh, Volkerkunde here in Leiden. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. So much for this uh, for this talk. All of a sudden, we learned that that maps and art history is is rather closely related, but also politics, of course, just as what we want to do as art historians, not only looking at the aesthetics, but also at the politics, of propaganda, and things like that. So, in that way, I do think that that what art history really wants to do these days is closely familiar to what you are doing with with maps. In that way we do have common grounds. And on this notice, when I said common grounds, <laughs> I got light on green. So those are for questions for you in the, in the room. Who has a question? Let me start while you're thinking about a question for one of the questions online. Actually, the question was if every uh, of those maps you showed came from, from the Leiden collections, or uh, of course you, you made clear that the, the contemporary uh, story from Australia was not, but are the rest of, of, uh, of uh, the Leiden collection? And the other question that, that, that was asked was, which uh, map do you really want to have in the Leiden collections which is not in the Leiden collection yet? Oh, that last one is a very tricky question. Uh, I have a whole uh, wish list of maps we don't have. But uh, to start with the first one, so the most maps in the exhibition are from uh, Leiden University libraries. But some of the things I sh showed uh, are the input of the museum. So for instance, the map of Utopia uh, was an ID from the curator of the museum, but it was a loan from the Van Abbe Museum in uh, Eindhoven. And also uh, the work, the last thing I showed by Faisal Saro was uh, an ID from uh, the people of the museum. So there are more things and I haven't shown uh, all the pieces uh, of the exhibition uh, uh, in my presentation. Um, so maybe one fourth, one fifth of the pieces in the exhibition are not uh, maps from the library, something like that. A wish list, yeah, tricky question. Uh, what map do I want? There is a very special map um, which shows the... Um, uh, what is the English word? Specerije? Uh, spices, of course. The spices um, on a map of the uh, East Indies. Um, that is one of the maps we don't have. And for instance, uh, what Amsterdam University Library has. 
but uh, maybe it's nice I can say our latest uh, edition was a big map, manuscript map of Suriname from 1830, uh, two and a half meters long, and uh, I reached even the national uh, television news with that, so that was, uh, <laughs> everybody will uh, knows about it uh, now. <laughs> Questions for the people? All right, I give you the mic so that also online they can uh, they can hear you. So just take it close to your uh, mouth, and then everyone will understand. Um, my question concerns the contemporary art, and uh, I was really interested to know what the communication was with the artists, and um, uh, between the museum and the artists, and also perhaps if you know what the artists thought of being exhibited in an anthropological museum rather than an art museum and that whole discussion as well, if you have comments on that. Okay. Yeah, that uh, differs a bit from artist to artist. So for instance, Faisal Saro, uh, we had uh, quite intensive contacts uh, with. Uh, his installation was previously exhibited in Groningen, so um, we came in contact with him and he was really involved in uh, the setup of the exhibition and the special video was made with him. Um, but for uh, other artists, it, was, it is simply a loan of one piece from a museum, for instance, the, the map of Utopia. I don't think we had uh, any... Uh, um, any contact with the uh, with the original artist, so that differs a bit from uh, piece to piece. And I I think they liked it that they were exhibited in a non-art museum because it's all artists who work in one way or another with maps or with the idea of mapping. So they really liked it to be in a kind of map exhibition. Um, <coughs> I have. Uh, Two questions. First of all, are all the maps of the exhibition also in the book? And the second one is, does, uh, does the university collection still have budget to, uh, to, to buy the things you still really need? Or are you just depending on gifts of people dead or alive? Okay, that are t two very uh, different questions. Uh, so are all the maps in the book? Not all of them. So, well, our first idea was to make an exhibition with the book, just all the maps in the book, put that in an exhibition, easy. But, uh, of course, the museum had other ideas, and I think that was, uh, for the exhibition, really an improvement. So it's more a uh, clearer story we, we, uh, we tell, in, and a more um, specific story we tell in this exhibition. So most of the maps uh, from the library are also in the book. There are a few exceptions, uh, and the modern uh, works of art are not in the book. But uh, I hope uh, I have contact now, for instance, with uh, Faisal Saro. Uh, maybe uh, we have the opportunity that he can create a new piece of art based on one of our maps uh, and add that to the collection. So that's a, more, uh, a nice bridge to your second question. Um, we have a, a budget for um, acquisition for special collections, which is limited. Um, so there are also uh, funding systems we can uh, use every now and then. We have uh, uh, friends of the university library, uh, so we can use uh, that. They also contributed to the acquisition of the Suriname map, which was also an unusual map that uh, uh, went beyond the normal uh, budgets. And for that map, we also create or organized an, a special uh, evening for um, yeah, people who, want, who could uh, contribute to make this acquisition uh, Possible. So there are various ways to uh, try to get enough funding to uh, add something special to the collection every now and then. All right. Thank you very much for being here, all of you. Thank you so much for this talk. I really liked it. And next time, I hope to see you all again. Bye bye. <laughs>